Good day. My name is Peter Cashin. I'm the CEO of Original Mining Corporation. Uh, we're here today. I'm here today with Charles Beaudry to speak about um, the uh, new model, the generalities of the model that we've addressed through various emails. Uh, we thought it's about time to speak to the, in greater detail to our findings and why we proceeded in the fashion that we did. Uh, by way of introduction, Charles uh, Beaudry is the uh, VP of Exploration of ORCAP, one of the or, uh, one of the investment vehicles of uh, the OR Group. Uh, Charles has worked many years with Naranda in the Metagamy camp and is very, very familiar with uh, VMS. Um, and my background is that I, I actually worked the Roger project, which is the object of our discussion this afternoon uh, in the 1980s. Uh, when I was working for a junior, I was the one that initiated the underground program. So with that, I'd like to lead into uh, questions for Charles. Um, I, maybe you can speak uh, to the audience, Charles, about the uh, the historical views on mineralization and then um, some of the evidence that we came up with that led us in the direction of a VMS model. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Peter. Yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the perspective that I, I, I think we should take is that the, 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 the gold deposit, which is about five 600,000 ounces, open pitable at about 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams with a little bit of copper. Um, when, when I was uh, introduced to the project uh, a few years back, um, it, uh, it, uh, it was... Uh, it was taken for granted that this was an orogenic gold deposit. I mean, literally. And uh, so that's, that's the way that I viewed it. Uh, we're looking at the, at the exploration potential on the property. We were viewing it as a, as a, as a gold, as an orogenic gold project. But that's when, when you came into the dossier, you, the key, uh, the key element was that you remembered that on the, on the South side of the, um, of the uh, of the deposit, the the you guys were drilling into uh, what appeared to be an exhalative uh, horizon with sulfides, chloride, and uh, some base metals with gold, and uh, and that really was the the initial impetus. Uh, be, by just by asking that question, we had the core, we had uh, we had the logs, and it was possible to go and have a look at at what were, what was there. So I would say that uh, really that's, that's how we came about to start thinking about this in terms of the VMS. And to be honest, initially when you introduced it to me, I was a bit skeptical uh, you know, about, the, about the story. But as, as you started presenting data evidence, uh, which I, I think you could, you could probably talk to right now uh, about you know, what was the evidence that, uh, that, that made us uh, think that this could really be a VMS system. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thanks, Charles. Uh, yeah, but if you take a look at the history, exploration history, and production history of the Shibugumu camp, a lot of the mineralization is is epi epithermal. So um, it's basically uh, quartz based veins that are very rich in copper and gold. And I think that that historical model was applied to um, anything that was in close proximity to the Shibugumu camp. Um, and I think. I, you know, I established a model in the 80s, uh, the porphyry model, because we didn't have that much evidence. I and mean, I think I gained experience in the in the area of VMS and uh, post uh, my, my involvement with Roger. So I looked at the core. I was seeing some unusual features, uh, one being base metals or zinc-rich base metals sitting in an ultramafic, which is... Uh, right off the top is odd. There shouldn't be any zinc related to this kind of a lithology. So then I went back into the core and I, you know, I started seeing base metal intersections. You know, before we went out and looked at the core together in Chepe later in August, um, that once we put them into the 3D uh, environment, 3D space, we actually saw a general alignment. And the alignment was that it seemed to be formational versus structural. You're, you're talking the, about the intersections in the historic drill hole. That's correct, in the old uh, Sokam yeah. diamond drill. Yeah, yeah, primarily, yeah. And and they were of good grade. I mean, there were some high copper uh, zinc numbers uh, along about 1.4 kilometers of strike, 
the and third, decent width like too. What's that? Sorry. And some decent widths too. Very widths. Yeah, anywhere between a, a meter and a half and and five six meters. So, yeah. Um, and you and I, I think, came to the conclusion. Well, this is an exhalite. It's probably in a distal environment because we we see the right kind of alteration. So. We went back to the core. We confer, you know, I looked at the core. I confirmed with you that I think we're dealing with a volcanic and not an intrusive environment. Um, most of the historical work that had been done is basically metals. Uh, the analysis that were done at the labs were metals. And there's a lot of tools that are now currently used for uh, evaluating the fertility of volcanic rocks for VMS. So we did that work, we did the sampling. Um, you, I'll have you talk a little later about uh, the sample we took for age dating because we wanted to make that we're, you know, we're in the right structural or stratigraphic position for the potential of a VMS. So we did all that work. Once we got the data back um, and we put the model together, I mean, I was seeing really strong analogies and, and we're, we're going to put up some of the uh, classification diagrams that we put together from the results of the geochemistry work. And we started seeing very strong analogies to Laurent. It's a volcanic environment. It appears to have uh, aluminum-rich alteration, aluminous alteration. It has the right kind of rocks, both on the footwall and the hangwall. Um, and and I, uh, there was we understood that at surface there was no geophysics. So we said, well, it, if there's going to be a conductor, and we're dealing with a single horizon it's likely going to be below 400 meters. And that was kind of the premise of the model. So maybe I can have you talk about the significance of the age dating that we had, that we, uh, of the yeah. sampling that you'd done. Yeah. But yeah, I think before I, before I talk about the, about the date, I just want to say that uh, when, when we, when you look at the geology of the gold deposit that, that there, um, the, the, uh, the the uh, it, it it looks like a porphyry system like uh, I mean it's not clear what uh, what age that thing is but it's what's clear is that it looks like a porphyry system but it could also be uh, a a uh, rhyolite cryptodome okay right. so that and there was evidence of that in the core in some of the some of the textures we're seeing near the uh, near the the uh, the VMS or the exhalative horizon so a decision was made to actually uh, do a, a, a date. So what we did is we collected material uh, from some key holes in the, in the area that showed well the, the porphyritic textures. And we, we submitted that and, they, and they, what they did was they ground it, extracted the, 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 um, the zircons and mounted the zircons in, the, in epoxy. And then it went to Laurentian University where they, they, they zapped the, uh, the, the zircons uh, with laser uh, ablation, and then uh, analyze the the vapors, and uh, and the the uh, the date was was it came out. There was first of all there was lots of zircons, and the and the date was a tight cluster, and it came out at twenty seven ten uh, uh, million million years, which is the same age as the top of the Gilman or the 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 Bruno formation, I think it's called, or Bruno member in that area. Correct. And um, and so that confirmed that we were dealing with a synvolcanic uh, system. And so that's really uh, that was kind of the clincher in the in the whole story because if there obviously the porphyry had come out at twenty six ninety, we would have known that it would have been a different story. Right. So that was the really the main point. So I think I think it's important maybe to to speak about the cryptodome environment. I mean, most VMSs uh, tend to be atop uh, what was originally a felsic dome or a, a, an intrusive dome, and the volcanics were were extruded from that. That was basically your heat pump. Often on the rinse. edge, but on the edge, on, on the, the edge, edge of it, the correct. The it was your heat the pump the to get the whole yeah, thing going. Right. And I mean, and the analogy you could see on on uh, PBS is these black smokers, these chimneys yeah. just spewing out yeah. black uh, met metalliferous uh, yeah. uh, deposits. And yeah. but you can imagine you take that stuff and you accumulate it over millions of years, and then you build a significant volume of, of massive sulfides. Um, so that's that's the basis of I, I think the importance of calling this thing a, a cryptodome. So let's talk about the uh, the EM survey, uh, the downhole surveys that we did, and the and the uh, 
the targets that we that we generate. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> like I said earlier, we knew that at surface there was no conductors. So uh, most surface geophysical methods or airborne geophysical methods uh, for electromagnetics don't penetrate much past the 400 meter level. Um, so we we knew that we tracked those those accelerative horizons. We knew that we couldn't see a, a conductor at least in the upper 400 meters from surface. So anything that existed would have to be below that level. So. Um, because SOCAM had done quite a bit of drilling, um, that I selected a, a series of the deepest holes onto the Roger system. And then we, they were all capped. The, the casing was in place. The idea being is we remove the caps and then you can do, you send a tool down, uh, a detector down, you have a big electro, electric loop at surface and the, and the, 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 uh, sensor picks up the uh, whether or not there's a uh, conductor within about 150 meter radius of the the axis of the hole so the idea being is that, well if there's anything down there the em system will see it and we were fortunate enough to get some very very strong conductivity that indicates the presence of you know base metal sulfides uh, certainly the conductivity was such that it, it is not graphite. It's likely related to uh, copper mineralization. Well, that's good. Okay, so now uh, what? Um, now, okay, when now we've identified these targets. Okay, so the the so what's what is the you know how we're going to go about in testing these things? Well, it's um, I I use a bit of an analogy. Our resources found the Lubicor deposit basically with the same approach. They didn't see conductivity at surface. They, they were on the Valdor Formation, which is very rich for VMS. There was the Lubem deposit to the west. There was the Manitou Barview uh, massive sulfide to the east, but nothing in between. So they said, well, same idea. Obviously, there, if there's anything there, we have to go below 400 meters. Then they did that, and they pulsed the holes, and they got an off-hole conductor, and they chased after the the, uh, the system, and sure enough, they, they knocked off the deposit in that fashion. Well, that's exactly the same approach that we want to have here. We've identified approximately a kilometer and a half of strike of this exhalative horizon, which we think is distal, meaning a distance from the core of the system. We'll go down with deeper holes, probably 500 meters vertical, and then ultimately pulse those holes. If we're fortunate enough in our drilling that we knock off on some base metal sulfide intersections, then we're, we're off to the races. Uh, the, and the downhole will certainly tell us, well, if there a vector for the true core of the system, and then we just basically follow uh, follow up on the geophysics uh, that we detect from the from the downhole program. Okay, that's good. That's excellent. I think that sets up. So, how much uh, how much drilling do you, do we plan for this uh, this program? Um, it's uh, eight holes, approximately five thousand meters. Uh, the holes will be anywhere between five hundred and seventy five and six hundred and fifty meters in length and they will intersect the system at about 500 meters and then we'll come in with the downhole geophysical survey for each of the holes and look for those uh, off hole conductors that could be that could, we could see down to about 650 700 650 meters. correct yeah. if it's a strong conductor as we had the discussion with geophysicists uh, we could see up to 200 250 meters away if it's a very very strong conductor so Good. but to be safe I mean, it'll be within 150 meters of the hole. Okay, well, that's good. Okay, well, then we're all set. We're all set to go. Just all we need is the permits, and uh, and uh, so it'll be done this winter, I guess. Huh? Yep, we're, um, the permitting is advancing well. We should have something in place by uh, before the end of the year, um, this year, 2025, and the idea being is going back and drilling at uh, about mid-February, uh, completing the work before the, the thaw, and it'll give us a time uh, to be able to evaluate the data. And if we hit on something, then uh, all all bets are off. We'll be back in there for definition work. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Charles. Thank you very much for listening.